Okay, we're going to have a look at a nice open cluster in the constellation of uh, Auriga, the Charioteer. It's M37, one of three very nice clusters in the uh, constellation. So I'm just going to move the telescope a small amount of uh, distance and then we can switch back to the imaging software to take an image. So this is an image of the open cluster M37. It's a typical open cluster. This one's about 4,000 light years away. Now this image is one I took a few years ago using a small telescope through what we call a V-band filter. The V-band being the central part of the visible spectrum in sort of greenish yellow light. If we take another image through the B-band filter, that's blue light, shorter wavelength, what we can do is measure the brightness of all the stars through those two filters. And if we take the difference between those two values for each star, that B minus V value is actually a measure of the colour of the star which in turn is a measure of the temperature of its outer layers. It's a fairly uninspiring open cluster, so I was trying to find out something about it. And one of the first things I found when I started reading up in the literature about it is its trumpler class. And if I write down its trumpler class for you and then go through it, so this is... What's that word? Trumpler. So it's named after Robert Trumpler, who's the astronomer who came up with this classification scheme in the first place. Cracking so, name. Yeah, great. He's uh, worked in the Lick Observatory in the US. Oh, another great name. Um, yeah, so anyway, there's three components to this classification. There's a Roman numeral, in this case a one, an Arabic numeral, in this case another one, and a letter, in this case an R. And so the first one, the Roman numeral 1, is to do with how centrally concentrated it is. Uh, and so there's three choices, Roman 1, Roman 2, Roman 3, and Roman 1 is the most centrally concentrated. So just from that number, I know that this is a star cluster where there's lots of stars close to the middle, and then it sort of dies off quite quickly after that. The second one, the Arabic one, is to do with the range of brightness of stars there are. So again, there's three choices, 1, 2, or 3. And 1 means that basically all the stars you can see are more or less the same brightness all the way through to three, which means there's a large range from very bright to very faint stars. Then the last element of this is this letter R, and again there were three choices, R, M, I think it is from in the middle, and P for rich, medium, and poor, and that's just to do with how many stars there are in the cluster. So I think if I remember rightly, rich means there's more than 100 stars in the cluster. These are just 10 second exposures, so the exposure time is very short. It's, it'd be enough to pick up the stars in the cluster, but it'll only just be a snapshot image. Is this a cluster you would ever bother imaging? I haven't in the past, so it's quite interesting for me to see how this actually looks with my own setup. And there we go, it's um, quite an interesting cluster. You can see quite a few stars there. With open clusters, of course, they do tend to be fairly similar. They're just made up of stars in a cluster, effectively. So, having measured the brightness of each star and the colour of each star, we can plot those things on a graph. We call it a colour magnitude diagram. And what you see is that most of the stars in this cluster lie along a single track here. We call that the main sequence. And what that is, is the region of the colour magnitude diagram where stars spend most of their lives. It's where they sit when they're undergoing hydrogen fusion into helium in their cores. So at the top of the main sequence, we have the most massive stars, and they're the brightest and hottest. Down at the bottom of the main sequence, we have the low mass stars, and they're the faintest and coolest. Now, it turns out that the high-mass stars evolve more quickly than the low-mass stars. So stars will move off the top of the main sequence in order of mass. We know how long it takes stars of different mass to evolve off the main sequence, so by measuring for M37 just where the top of the main sequence lies, we can tell what the age of this cluster is. And it turns out that M37 has an age of about 350 million years. This classification scheme was come up by this guy, Robert Trumpler, in 1930. Um, and so I actually went and had a look at his original paper as to why he'd come up with this classification scheme in the first place. He was interested in using these clusters as things called standard rulers of saying if they were all the same size intrinsically, then you could figure out how far away they were from how big they looked. He very quickly found that that didn't work, and that's because star clusters come in a wide range of sizes. So his next step was to say, aha, well maybe I can pick out subcategories that are all the kind of the same size as each other. And so you'll notice this classification scheme is rather clever because all the things in it are not really dependent on the distance of the cluster. He did actually create kind of a map of the Milky Way, and what he found was things that he put further away, if he then looked at how bright the stars were, they were even fainter than you'd expect. You know, you'd expect if you move a cluster twice as far away, the stars should get four times fainter. What he actually found is that the stars were even fainter. 
And so this was the first real direct measurement of the degree of obscuration in the plane of the Milky Way. He was actually measuring the fact that the light doesn't all get through to us because there's all this dust and soot between us and the object. If you were spending hours on this, what would be different about your photo? The image would be better because you have many more stars in there because the longer exposure to bring out stars from the background, we'd lose all of these effects which are being caused by the moonlight, the gradient across the image, and it would be a colour image as well. That would involve taking images you know, through three colour filters and um, much more exposure, so that we'd have to sort of be a little bit more careful about how the telescope was pointing and tracking and we'd spend a lot more time actually sort of acquiring the data. And then once it's processed, we'd have a nice sort of colourful image of these, these stars in the sky. So M37 then formed about 350 million years ago in one of the spiral arms of our galaxy. As the stars age individually, they'll evolve through their lives and eventually move off the main sequence. But more important than that, perhaps, as the stars rotate around our galaxy, the stars in this open cluster, M37, will gradually disperse. They'll gradually drift away from where they were born. In fact, one of the other things that Trumpler discovered is that on average, the richest of these clusters, the brightest, the most centrally concentrated, tend to be the oldest. The little wimpy ones fall apart sooner. But that means that at the end of its life, you can actually end up with a bunch of stars which are kind of spreading out through space. They're starting to become gravitationally unbound. And then they become a thing that's usually called a moving group. It's not still gravitationally bound together. It's not really a single system anymore, but all the stars are all heading in more or less the same direction because they remember what direction the cluster was heading in. So maybe in a few tens or hundreds of million years' time, this cluster will no longer exist. Many of the stars will still be burning, but they will have drifted away from where they were born, and so this cluster will have dispersed, and there'll be no sign that it was ever there.